Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk to you about a few things that some of you have asked me about, and uh, it's actually really important to me. So uh, it's the the topic is is what it would take for me to be released from prison again. And generally speaking, um, uh, I was given a life sentence when I was 18 years old. So the only way that I can legally get out is if I receive a commutation of my sentence. Uh, commutation is handed out by the Nebraska Board of Pardons and it is used very sparingly. Uh, for the most part, the Board of Pardons uh, says that their standard is that there has to be extraordinary circumstances in order for them to change a valid uh, life sentence. Um, there has been some changes with respect to life sentences and the way that juveniles are uh, managed and the case that really changed things for those guys was uh, Miller versus Alabama. Now Miller versus Alabama talked about how juveniles have a diminished capacity as a result of their immaturity, their lack of understanding of the consequences of their actions, as well as a lot of the other things that go into being immature and uh, uh, underage. So Miller versus Alabama talked about brain development and uh, in my particular circumstance I started using substances very young. Uh, by the time I was 12 years old I was uh, using marijuana and drinking on a regular basis. By the time I was 15 I was huffing gas, uh, hooked on methamphetamines and using any other substances that I could get my hand on. I was also drinking very heavily at that point um, by the time I was 15, I was incarcerated for the first time and sent to the Youth Development Center in Kearney. Uh, since that time, I went through inpatient drug treatment at Valley Hope in O'Neill, Nebraska. And I've been there twice, completed it one time, left early the second time. Uh, so my recovery uh, has been kind of shaky from an early, early age. Uh, right before I was arrested for murder, I was uh, strung out on methamphetamines. I'd been awake for 72 hours prior to the crime itself. And I was uh, influenced by a peer of mine that was, uh, he was on the run from a probation violation and I was trying to help the guy out. And ultimately, if it wasn't for him asking for my assistance, I would have went home and went to bed. Uh, I was not trying to go out and rob any, any stores that night. I wasn't carrying any uh, weapons with me that night until he had asked me to do so. So I, I think it's important because that Miller versus Alabama case talks about how peer support or peer uh, involvement uh, plays a part in a juvenile's decision-making process. And even though I was over the age of 18, my brain development was that of a juvenile as a result of having used substances so early in life. I think that the brain science supports that. I think it's very clear that if anybody looks at what uh, what's going on with a person that's under age 18, they would know that immaturity is a big factor, even when you get into your early 20s. So I think that's really a big deal. Um, now, one of the things that I can uh, tell you about is that my recovery started in a pretty harsh way when I was in prison. By the time I was uh, 24 years old, I tried to escape from prison and I was shot by prison guards in 2001. I was placed in segregation for about two and a half years and it left me with a lot of time to reflect and think about where my life was at, how much I have ruined my life as well as those around me. Uh, and, and that was a really um, a foundation builder for me to start to not only get sober, but to start studying psychology. I started studying the law while I was in segregation. It gave me a lot of um, uh, insight into why I do some of the things that I do. And it also helped me start to repair a lot of my character defects. One of the bigger impacts in my life that really helped me uh, get myself together was when I lost my dad in 2007. Uh, he passed away from cancer and it was really a hard time for me. I went through a period of relapse. Uh, I did have uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, hard feelings towards God because I thought my dad was a really good guy that didn't deserve to die. Uh, and so when I went through those painful moments, it made me really reflect on what my victim's family must have went through when I took their mother or their sister or their friend. Uh, it, it, it really was one of those times in my life that it, it hit home to me as to what my actions actually did to another family. Uh, it was a big deal for me to really get to that point because it now has helped me form a plan and a mission to do something better with my, the remainder of my life. To, I, I guess, pay respect to the fact that I understand now, I get it. 
I know what it means to lose somebody close to me, and uh, I think that that's a very big part of my recovery and what keeps me grounded at this point. Uh, some of the extraordinary circumstances that I have that I might uh, impress upon the Board of Pardons uh, are that, you know, my co-defendant, the person that was the person uh, the responsible for talking me into going out that night to commit crime, has actually been released from prison in 2018. Uh, he's now on parole. He has been out for a period of months. I have absolutely no idea uh, how he's doing or if he's staying out of trouble, but uh, it is important that he is uh, out of prison because there are certain cases that talk about how co-defendants are supposed to be treated equally. And since he's been released, I feel that maybe there's an opportunity there to discuss whether or not I deserve another opportunity to be released as well. Uh, since I've been incarcerated, I've, I've started to educate myself in a lot of different areas. In 2008, the year after I lost my dad, I earned my paralegal diploma. Uh, since that time, I've studied law through Nebraska Wesleyan University when they brought classes out to the prison. Uh, now I'm currently enrolled in Adams State University as a degree-seeking student. I have 51 credit hours completed towards a bachelor's degree. Um, I am also uh, valedictorian of the Five Ventures, which was recently has recently changed their name to Rise. And I'm pretty excited that today I found out that I may be able to actually teach some guys about uh, financial literacy through an added marathon program that that Rise is going to be offering soon. Now that's a pretty big deal. Another component that I have going on is that I have been nationally certified as an intentional peer support specialist. This is something that we have taken approximately 80 hours of training at this, uh, at this point as well as um, this is the only facility that I know of that currently goes to segregation units to provide intentional peer support. Uh, there's a Mental Health Association of Nebraska provides outside support for this particular program and, and are responsible for obtaining the training for us. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I've also completed restorative justice, which was something that I talked about before, but it's, it's really a big deal because it talks about giving people an opportunity to come together and, and determine what's right uh, in the, the, when someone's been harmed and how that actually looks from a standpoint of making sure that people heal. Uh, I think it's a really important practice that the current criminal justice system could adopt and I would hope to think or I'd like to think that the, the pardons board could adopt some of those philosophies as well. Uh, I've also uh, during my incarceration I've written two books. Uh, they are on Amazon. One is called Lessons Learned from Playground to Penitentiary. Uh, the other one is called Convict Logic from Leadership to a Better Life. Both of these books really demonstrate some of the challenges that I've went through since I've been incarcerated. And it was a part of writing those books um, to share my story so maybe others could possibly avoid uh, incarceration as well as some of the mistakes that I've made. I would like to read a little excerpt out of Lessons Learned. Um, it's on page 144. And it says, at the end of the day, I hope and pray for my victim's family more than I do for myself. I pray that they will find peace and happiness. I ask God to place his protective angels around them and keep all harm from coming to them. It is my sincere hope that my prayers are answered and they will, that they will live a great life in spite of the horrible tragedy that I brought upon them. I am truly sorry for everything I've done and I pray that I can complete my mission in life to do something great to make up for the harm that I've caused. May God have mercy on my soul. Amen. I definitely hope that my prayers are answered. Uh, I mentioned my mission in life and that looks like uh, I don't know the answer to how this is going to play out for me but I'm going to strive and try to thrive even in this harsh environment to make things better for those that are either coming behind me or somebody that I can possibly prevent from coming in here in the first place. So throughout all of this I really hope that my explanation of a commutation has been useful. Uh, I'm really uh, dedicated to trying to change my life and I'm certainly hoping that through this conversation that maybe uh, a little bit of dialogue can be generated to find a way for me to potentially get back home. Uh, I really uh, hope that everyone enjoyed this video and I certainly wish to see each and every one of you as soon as possible. Uh, you can log on to jpay.com and email me if you would like to. And I want to thank everybody for your support.
Well, thank you.